Yeah, most people at least have the slides, so it shouldn't be that bad. I mean, it's either printed or have on the computer. Oh, God. This classroom stinks. I don't know why nothing ever works here. I don't know why we're here. I know. Is everyone ready? Yes. Yes. The microphone does not seem to be working. Can you hear me okay back there? Oh, no. I'll try to scream a little bit, I guess. Um, how's that? Is that okay? okay? You really can't hear me? You're very quiet. Well, um... <clears throat> I guess I'll have to really, I'll try to speak loudly, it's not really in my nature, but I'll try, so let me know, just wave to me if I'm going too low, is that okay? Um, how do you like this room, by the way? So, yeah, I'm kind of feeling the same way a little bit, so um, I will try to figure out what's going on with this, and also I don't know why if I use my laptop it kind of cuts off the, the pages, but we'll try to make do, I suppose. So, um, so today we will start with antibiotics 101, basically. And so, um, so the next, so basically on the syllabus, the next few lectures are all titled something like antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance. And so, we're going to be going through basically um, all of the different drugs that I feel like you should know. And so. Uh, you should be able to cate categorize antimicrobials according to the class that they belong to. Uh, we'll talk again about the spectrum of activity. You might recall that last semester in pharmacology, I kept kind of minimizing the spectrum of activity. That's going to be more important for you to know this semester, so to know what drugs cover which bugs. Um, so we'll talk mainly about, as I said yesterday, aerobes, a little bit less so about anaerobes. Um, you'll notice, too, that I've Kind of in parentheses next to antimicrobials, I've put antibiotics. And so I'm going to be talking only about antibiotics with um, Dr. Kuhn later on. You'll learn about antivirals, antifungals as well. But we'll be talking only about antibiotics over the next few days. Um, and then again, we'll go back to your mechanisms of action and resistance, which I'm sure you all know off the top of your heads, right? Sure. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about those. We'll talk about PKPD. We'll talk about drug drug interactions, adverse effects contraindications, et cetera. Can you hear me fairly well back there? So um, just before we start with the drugs, just a brief word. Um, you're going to be seeing lots of different organism names. Organism names can sometimes, when you first look at them, look a little bit kind of bizarre as far as, far as how to pronounce them. Also, there is a really defined nomenclature when it comes to bacterial names and other microbiological, microbiology names. And so you have things like Staphylococcus species, um, SPP is the abbreviation for species. So just showing you some of the ways that you might see me write some of these different organisms. Staphylococci would refer basically to all staph species. Then you get down to the species level, so Staphylococcus aureus, and then S aureus would be another way to, to express Staphylococcus aureus. Um, one good thing for you is that on exams for my section, you're not responsible for spelling these organisms correctly. Although you have to at least be in the ballpark so I know what you are referring to. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you misspell Aureus, you'll still get credit as long as I can tell you meant Aureus, basically. Um, and then if any of you are curious how you say some of these organism names, if you go to this website, and this is one of just many websites, but this is the the website that I usually use, if you go to that website, there are a listing of different or rather organism names, and when you click on each one of the links, this little voice comes up and basically pronounces the, the name of that organism. So if you're ever curious how you say something like Neisseria gonorrhea, then you can go to this website and you'll get some MP3s basically of some of the more common different species. So this is the next few days of lecture, so it'll be uh, a long adventure through all these different drugs, but I think, again, it's good for you to kind of get a baseline and know all of the ins and outs of the different drugs, and that will help you when we start talking about disease states. And so today we'll talk only about beta-lactams and aminoglycosides, and then on Monday we'll start going through some of the other uh, drugs. So we'll talk about the macrolides, lincosamides, which basically is clindamycin, then we'll go through tetracyclines, Folate antagonists, so TNP-SMX would be the most important one that we'll talk about right there. 
We talk about quinolones. There is a group that I like to call gram-positive drugs, which are used primarily for their gram-positive activity, especially against really resistant gram-positives. So that would include glycopeptides like vancomycin, um, oxazolidinones like linazolid, and then adaptomycin. Um, interestingly, in this group of drugs here over the summer, we've actually had three new antibiotics that have been released. So it's kind of an exciting time for us as far as actually having new drugs because as I think I've talked to you a little bit about, uh, basically we have very little in the way of new drugs being developed, but this summer we had this watershed moment where we actually had three new drugs come out. Um, then we'll talk about drugs that are used specifically for their activity against anaerobes, um, and then we'll finally go through a few sort of miscellaneous drugs as well. So there'll be a lot of drugs, a lot of drug interactions, et cetera, but just kind of try to bear with me over the next few days and you'll hopefully have a good grounding in all those different drugs. So first would be the beta-lactams. So remember that um, these agents work by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. And so in either gram-positives or gram-negatives, again, here you have a gram-positive with this really thick cell wall and a gram-negative with that much thinner cell wall um, with the cell membrane on the outside of that cell wall. But in any case, these drugs all work to inhibit the normal production of cell walls. And so you basically lose the integrity of the bacterial cell. Um, so hence, these drugs tend to be bactericidal agents. So remember the difference between bactericidal and static drugs. So static drugs simply inhibit growth, and they depend on the immune system to kind of help the drugs out, whereas bactericidal drugs are lethal against um, bacteria. So as you might recall, all things being equal, would you rather use a cidal drug or a static drug? Cidal. So a cidal drug. And we'll talk about examples of that where you might have um, a choice of therapy, and sometimes the cidal drug becomes the preferred drug as long as there aren't other things that are weighing against that particular drug. Um, also, these are time-dependent killers. So remember that there's two major types of bacterial killing. There's time-dependent killing, and there's concentration-dependent killing. And so these drugs basically depend on the amount of time that concentrations are in your body and are above the MIC. The MIC, if you recall, is the minimum concentration that inhibits growth of an organism, and that's how we basically measure antibiotic activity. And so we'll talk about the MIC next week more, and how to interpret MICs. So these really depend on the amount of time that they're in the body, and not so much on the dose of drug that you give. Um, and then from a resistance mechanism, so there are really three primary means by which bacteria become resistant to beta-lactams. First would be corin changes, and so corins are basically sort of channels that cross the cell membrane and the cell wall. Drugs go through porins to get into the cell. And so if you have a, a change in that porin, the drug is trying to get through that porin and it just can't basically fit itself through. And so you have decreased entry into the cells. Um, another mechanism would be alterations in penicillin binding proteins. And so penicillin binding proteins are the targets for these drugs. And so remember that if you know the mechanism of action, you automatically know one of the major mechanisms of resistance. And so since these drugs bind to PPPs, <coughs> then PPPs can change their structure and you can have reduced binding of the drug to the target cell. And then the third mechanism, which isn't actually listed here, would be, anyone remember? Right, so beta-lactamase production. So bacteria can make beta-lactamase enzymes that basically chop your beta-lactams into two and render them ineffective. And then, um, just to clarify as well, so uh, MRSA, or methicillin resistant staph aureus, a major problem, as you probably know from the news nowadays, so one of the more important resistant pathogens that we have nowadays, very common both in the community and in hospital settings. So remember that the way that MRSA becomes resistant to methicillin is by production of a different type of penicillin binding protein. And so there's this gene called MECA, which encodes penicillin binding protein 2A. And so that's a different type of penicillin binding protein. And methicillin, for instance, can't bind to that penicillin binding protein 2A. And so MRSA is intrinsically resistant to methicillin, as well as most other beta-lactams. Um, other things about MRSA, and we'll be talking a lot about MRSA this semester. Um, MRSA also is able to basically ride along inside of your nostrils, and so it has little appendages that can adhere to the mucosa in your nostrils. And so often 
patients who are hospitalized, especially if you stick a cotton swab up their nostrils and culture it, they might grow MRSA if they're colonized with MRSA. So this is an important way that MRSA can spread amongst patients and become and make them colonized. And then also um, PBL, so Pantom Valentine leukocidin, is a toxin that MRSA produces, which contributes to the morbidity and the mortality that MRSA um, is associated with, especially community-associated MRSA strains that cause really severe skin and soft tissue infections because of that production of those toxins. So, um, beta-lactam pharmacokinetics. I'm not going to talk a ton about pharmacokinetics. I'm going to try to highlight some of the most important things about each of these classes of drugs. Um, variable PO absorption. So we do have some oral forms of beta-lactams that we use. Many of them, however, are IV only. So there's sort of a mixture of PO agents and IV agents. Um, when it comes to food, usually agents that you want to space from taking with food because of absorption problems. As far as distribution, they tend to have fairly wide distribution, so we can use them in a lot of different infections. Uh, when it comes to CNS penetration, so as you learn when we talk about meningitis, it's hard to get drugs into the central nervous system, and so there's a lot of different barriers, basically, to getting good drug concentrations into the CNS. Some of the cephalosporins, especially, including ceftraxone, get very good penetration into the CNS, and so they become very important agents to treat meningitis. And then finally, from a metabolism and excretion point of view, most of these drugs are limited renally, so you have to be careful with patients who have some degree of renal impairment. There are a few examples, and so nafcillin, oxacillin, and ceftraxone tend to be hepatically metabolized, so you have to be careful with patients who have hepatic issues. And then finally, most of these drugs have very short half-lives, and so these are drugs that tend to be dosed every eight hours, every six hours, even every four hours, so they pose problems from a from an adherence point of view and from a compliance point of view and an ease of dosing point of view. So quinolones, on the other hand, are often either Q-Day or BID drugs, but most of these drugs are not going to be single daily dosed or even twice daily dosed. So going through the, the penicillins first. So this kind of is the, the schematic that shows the, the different types of penicillins and what they're active against. And so. First you have the natural penicillin, so penicillin G and penicillin B. So penicillin G is the intravenous form and penicillin B is the oral form. So what are these active against? So basically they're active primarily against strep. That's one of the major reasons that we use these drugs. They do have sort of some niche uses, so they're active against Neisseria meningitidis, so again a cause of meningitis. They're also drugs of choice for treponema pallidum. Does anyone remember what treponema pallidum causes? Syphilis. Syphilis, right. So, Actually, I think one important point is that I think people sometimes think, well, penicillin is one of the first antibiotics that we ever had. Probably we don't really use it any, anymore for most things, and that's somewhat true, but actually when it comes to syphilis, penicillin still and always has been the drug of choice. Um, and so there are still some uses for our, our natural penicillins. Um, importantly, one big hole in coverage is that these drugs completely lack coverage of staphylococci also of most gram negatives as well. And so staphylococci basically all produce penicillinase enzymes, which are a type of beta-lactamase that inhibits or rather dest destroys the penicillin. And so these are strep drugs, but not staph drugs, which becomes an important distinction as far as their clinical use. So because these drugs are not active against staph, we basically developed the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. And so the penicillinase resistant penicillins. And so these penicillins, nafcillin is the parental version and dicoxillin is the oral <coughs> version, they are, um, they are not subject to hydrolysis by those penicillinase enzymes. And so they then have activity against both staph aureus and staph epidermis. Um, a little bit of strep coverage, but more so these agents are used for their staph coverage. And these drugs are particularly used, especially dicloxacillin, for management of skin infections where staph is a really important cause of skin infection. So you'll see a lot of dicloxacillin used for things like uncomplicated cellulitis and other skin infections. Um, no activity against MRSA, however. So remember, there's only one beta-lactam that we'll talk about that has activity against MRSA. <coughs> Um, also, poor activity against gram-negative. So these really are drugs for pretty much staph and very little else. 
So then we go to the amino penicillin, so amoxicillin and ampicillin, amoxicillin being the oral version and ampicillin being the IV version. So these really are going to be the first drugs that we use predominantly for their activity against Gram negatives. And so you're starting to add a little bit better um, coverage of resistant strep. And so streptococcus pneumoniae can often be resistant to penicillins, but if it is, it will often be susceptible to the amino penicillins. And here you're also adding coverage of your gram negatives. So not things like your pseudomonas and your other MDR gram negatives, but things like E. coli, Klebsiella, other enterobacteriaceae. And so there's a variety of infections where you would use amoxicillin and ampicillin, and primarily, again, for their gram negative Then we go to the carboxy penicillins, and so um, ticarcillin clavulanic acid, and so clavulanic acid is a beta lactamase inhibitor. Ticarcillin used to be available by itself, but it no longer is, so it's only available in that combination form. So here you're losing gram positive activity, and so as you go down this page, you're really there's a trend towards losing gram positive activity and gaining gram negative activity as you go down the page. And so ticarcillin is the first penicillin now that has activity against Pseudomonas and the other space bugs, which are, again, those often multidrug resistant gram-negative pathogens that you'll especially see in hospitalized patients. And then finally, you have the acyl ureto penicillins, and I won't be asking you chemistry-type questions, so don't worry about that. Um, but cupricillin tape back to him. So like ticarcillin, we used to have cupricillin available as a single agent, but now it's only available in combination with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, so that would be Zosin would be the brand name of Piptazo. Probably if you work in a hospital, you've seen a lot of Zosin, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. So an off, often a drug that we use for empiric therapy because it has a very broad spectrum of activity. And so um, a little bit better gram-positive activity compared to ticarcillin, but really nothing that you wouldn't really use Zosin primarily for its gram-positive activity. You're using it for its activity against, again, those space bugs, Pseudomonas, the other really hard to treat multi-resistant gram negatives. So this would be an agent that you would use primarily in hospitalized patients. <clears throat> so any questions about the spectrum of activity of the penicillins? So I'm going through in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, we've, we've been told that students like to hear both, um, how often does that happen? Let's just go on spontaneously. <laughs> um, so um, we've heard from students that they like to hear or like to see both generic and brand names. So you'll see that I have both. That said, there really doesn't exist anymore a brand name version of penicillin. And I actually had to do some digging to actually find out what the brand name of penicillin G or penicillin B would be. So um, take that with a grain of salt. I don't think you'll ever be seeing a prescription for Pfizer pen, for instance. But Anyway, so again, your natural penicillins are penicillin G or benzyl penicillin and penicillin B or phenoxymethyl penicillin. So again, going through a little bit of what we just talked about. So what do these drugs have activity against? So as I said, streptococcus species, including streptococcus pneumoniae, also streptococcus pyogenes, God bless you, um, but not active against staph. So they completely lack activity against staphylococcus aureus or epidermis. Again, really no gram-negative coverage. From an anaerobic point of view, these drugs do have coverage of your above the diaphragm anaerobes, so your oral anaerobes. But remember, most drugs do have activity against those oral anaerobes. So it's the below the diaphragm anaerobes that are typically more difficult to treat. And you'll see fewer drugs that have activity against the below the diaphragm anaerobes. Um, from a drug of choice point of view, these are not the drugs of choice for very many infections. but Group A strep, so strep pyogenes would be one example. So penicillin is still the drug of choice for strep throat. And then as I mentioned, syphilis as well is still um, very conclusively penicillins are the best drug of choice for patients who have syphilis. Next we have the penicillinase resistant penicillins. And so nafcillin and oxacillin would be the IV forms. And then dicloxacillin would be the oral form. Again, you're probably not going to see a prescription for Dynapen, but that's one example of a brand name of dicloxacillin. 
So as I mentioned before, so really these were developed to give us coverage of staphylococci. So they are not susceptible, susceptible to, um, to the breakdown by those penicillinase enzymes, basically. So again, that gives you coverage of MSSA, but not MRSA. And they do retain activity against streptococcal species, so streptomoniae, streptogenes, et cetera. Um, really no gram-negative coverage. Um, again, they retain activity against above the diaphragm anaerobes. You wouldn't really use these drugs very often to treat anaerobes, but you could potentially use them if you were worried about, again, oral anaerobes, perhaps. And so as far as where we use these drugs, again, they're the drugs of choice for MSSA, so they are the drugs of choice for a variety of different skin infections, such as uncomplicated cellulitis, where really staph and strep are what you're worried about when it comes to uncomplicated cellulitis and other skin infections related to that. Next, the amino penicillins, and so again, ampicillin and amoxicillin, so uh, one available both in oral and IV forms, the other available only as an oral agent. So remember again, here you're getting down that page and so you're adding a little bit more gram-negative coverage, and so these still retain good activity against strep, not so much against staph, um, so really more streptococcal drugs, and they lack activity against staph, uh, they do give you some coverage of enterococci, so these are the first penicillins that we could use to treat enterococcal infections. Um, again, more of a gram-negative drug, though, so they give you activity against E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, but those are the two most important of the enterobacteriaceae family that cause lots and lots of different infections. Um, things like Haemophilus influenzae, which is a common cause of respiratory tract infections, Proteus causes a variety of infections. So really these are used primarily for their gram-negative activity. Um, when it comes to anaerobes, yet another class of drugs that covers the above the diaphragm anaerobes, but not the below the diaphragm anaerobes. Um, these happen to be the drugs of choice for listeria infections. So listeria, um, common cause especially of meningitis, also of gastrointestinal infections. And so listeria, for instance, is one of the organisms that we see in foodborne outbreaks, so things like deli meats and cantaloupes and a variety of other foodborne outbreaks that you'll see once in a while. Um, from a tolerability point of view, from an oral bioavailability and tolerability point of view, amoxicillin is much more easily tolerated than ampicillin when it comes to the two oral formulations of these drugs. So next we have the uh, so-called extended spectrum penicillin. So here we have ticarcillin and piperacillin. So again, these drugs don't exist in this fashion anymore by themselves. They only exist paired with beta-lactamase inhibitor. But I'm showing the I'm showing you them by themselves because really their their coverage is inherently different compared to the previous penicillins. And so ticarcillin and piperacillin on their own do have a different level of coverage compared to the other penicillin. And so here again, we're moving more and more towards the gram-negative side of things, and so you wouldn't typically use these drugs to cover gram-positive. So they do cover streptococcal species. Piperacillin only covers Enterococcus faecalis, so one of the two types of Enterococci that we worry about routinely. Um, so again, these really are gram-negative drugs, including your Enterobacteriaceae, so they will include uh, coverage of E. coli, Klebsiella, all those different Enterobacteriaceae but then you're adding coverage of those space organisms. And so, again, Pseudomonas aeruginosa being the most important of those. When it comes to anaerobic coverage, these are the first that have a little smidgen of coverage of below the diaphragm anaerobes, but still more so used for their above the diaphragm anaerobic coverage. And so, um, really, these are agents that you wouldn't see in a community setting. You see these in hospitalized patients. These tend to have a broad spectrum of coverage, you would use them often in empiric therapy because they cover gram positives, gram negatives, anaerobes, and so a broad spectrum of coverage and something that you would use primarily in the severely ill patients where you're worried about covering as many things as you possibly can. And again, nowadays, from an availability point of view, these are only available in combination with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So everything making sense so far? Am I going too fast? Okay. Do you have a question? Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Um, so just to review beta-lactamases, and so um, there are hundreds of different types of beta-lactamases. There are people who basically spend their careers 
studying different types of beta lactamases and the drugs that um, they affect, basically. And so you can have specifically penicillinases, cephalosporinases, et cetera, that only have activity against that particular subset of the beta lactams. Unfortunately, recently we've had what are called ESBL, or extended spectrum beta lactamases, emerging more and more. And so the problem with these ESBLs is that from a beta lactam point of view, they are active against penicillins, cephalosporins. Um, the only drugs that are <coughs> active against ESBL producers would be the carbapenems. Um, then, unfortunately, ESBLs are often also resistant to not only penicillins and cephalosporins, but also to things like TNPSMX and quinolones and aminoglycosides and tetracyclines. And so ESBLs are a problem because there are relatively few types of drugs that we can actually use to treat infections that are caused by ESBLs. And so for that reason, really, carbapenems have become the drug of choice for ESBLs. And so what do you think happened when we started using carbapenems to treat ESBL infections? So they developed resistance to carbapenems. So again, that recent um, outbreak that has been in the news this week was due to carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae that they are ESBL producers that then also added activity against carbapenems. And so those are treatable by even fewer drugs, unfortunately, and those are major, relatively new problem that we're seeing across the country. So then that leads us to our beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations, and so we currently have four of these. Um, only one of them is available orally, so I'll augment in moxicillin acid. Then we have unison, which is ampicillin sulbactam, timentin, which is ticarcillin clavulanic acid or clavulanate, and then zosin, which is piperacillin tazobactam. So it's come basically pre-formulated as that combination product. So what does the beta-lactamase, the addition of that beta-lactamase do as far as coverage goes? Well, it, it gives you back coverage of, of staph, so it's gonna be active against the penicillinase production by staph aureus. Um, these also have fairly broad gram-positive coverage, so they will cover strep, they'll cover enterococcus faecalis, from a gram-negative point of view, they add, again, they have um, broad coverage of not only the Enterobacteriaceae, but also the space bug, Pseudomonas. Um, one important thing that the beta-lactamase inhibitor also does is it gives you very good anaerobic coverage, and so these are really the first beta-lactams that have true coverage of some of those below the diaphragm anaerobes. And so really, these drugs are extremely broad coverage, cover a lot of gram-positives, a lot of gram-negatives, a lot of anaerobes, which, depending on your point of view and depending on who you're treating, can either be a really, really good thing because you're covering lots of different pathogens, especially when you're in that empiric phase of therapy where you don't know what you're treating, but they can also be problems because we want to try to use narrow spectrum drugs when we can, and so often these, they're so broad spectrum that they can be used inappropriately because they're sort of a safety net because they'll cover practically everything you'd want to be worried about in a patient. So, as you'll learn more and more, there's a balance between broad spectrum coverage and being a little bit more narrow and targeted with your coverage of your different bacteria. So those are the penicillins. And so a, a sample question. So you have an elderly patient from a nursing home. Nursing homes are uh, breeding grounds for resistant bacteria. So he's admitted to the hospital, has pneumonia, um, because he's from a nursing home, he's at risk for having Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection, so his sputum is growing Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So which of the following antimicrobials would be an appropriate choice for this person at this time? So does anyone want to say Ampicil back? <coughs> Any takers for dicloxacillin? Any takers for Moxclav. Any takers for Piptazo? Hopefully everyone. So Piptazo would be the only agent that would cover Pseudomonas in this case. The others would all lack coverage of Pseudomonas. Um, near the very end of all of these series of lectures, I'll go through all the drugs that cover Pseudomonas. It would be important for you to know drugs that cover Pseudomonas, drugs that cover MRSA, the drugs that cover some of the more important pathogens that are resistance concerns, and we'll go through those at the very end. Um, 
So any any questions about penicillins and their different coverages? So now we have the cephalosporins. And so um, you've seen this slide before, I think. So remember, with cephalosporins, we talk about generations of cephalosporins. We don't have generations of penicillins, but we do for cephalosporins. And so you have your first generation on the left, your second, your third, your fourth. We now have a new, a new agent which hasn't really been classified as either, some people call it either an advanced generation cephalosporin, some call it a fifth generation cephalosporin. Hasn't been really officially designated one generation or another, but first, second, third, and fourth are very clearly um, established generations of, of cephalosporins. So in general, going from left to right across the generations and going up in your generations, in general, you add coverage of gram negatives as you go towards higher generations. We'll talk about the fact that there are many advanced generation cephalosporins that really do have good gram positive coverage and you use them for their gram positive coverage. But if there was a general trend, it would be from better gram positive on the left and better gram negative on the right. So we'll go through all the different generations and what they cover. Um, I find the cephalosporins honestly to be a frustrating class of drugs because there, there's so many of them and Cephalosporins are sort of easy targets for drug companies that don't have cephalosporins, and so um, unfortunately you have to just kind of work at knowing which ones are which. And so you should be responsible, or you will be responsible rather, for if I tell you the patient's receiving septinere, you should be able to remember what generation cephalosporin that is, unfortunately. So it's sort of an alphabet soup, but you'll have to just kind of make your way through it and get them all down the number. So, um, first generation agents. So we have cefadroxyl, cefalexin, and cefazolin. So two oral agents and one IV only agent. So what do these cover? So again, we're on that left side of the screen, so we're looking more at our gram positive coverage. And so these would have very good coverage of streptococcal species, very good coverage of <coughs> staph species. Again, though, not MRSA, only MSSA. From a gram-negative point of view, one of the, the kind of acronyms that you'll see is called PEC. So the P stands for proteus species, including proteus gravilis. The EC stands for E. coli. And then the K stands for Klebsiella pneumoniae. So these do have activity, again, against the two most important members of that enterobacteriaceae family of gram-negatives. From an anaerobe point of view, above the diaphragm only. And so really, these agents are primarily used, again, for skin and soft tissue infections, so relatively unsevere infections, if you will, because they cover staph, they cover strep, and those are the two most important things we see when it comes to skin infections. And so these have a relatively narrow um, therapeutic use when it comes to all the different cephalosporins. Next we have the second generation cephalosporins, so unfortunately there are a lot of these, and so we have Cepaclor, Cefprozil, Cefuroxine, Axotil, Cefotetin, Cefoxetine and then ceftriaxime, and so a number of oral agents and of IV agents as well. So these still retain gram positive coverage, so they still cover strep, they still cover staph, again, not MRSA, only MSSA. Um, from a gram negative point of view, they retain that PEC coverage, but they add what's called HEN by some people, and so that would be Mophilus influenzae. Enterobacter orogenes, and then Neisseria species as well. Um, so, you know, fairly good gram negative coverage, but again, if you think about these sort of as almost like your amino penicillin. So they cover the Enterobacteriaceae, but they don't cover things like Pseudomonas and those other space organisms. From an anaerobic point of view, these really, the, the primary ones that cover anaerobes would be your two cephamycin, cephamycins. And so cefoxetin and cefotetin are particularly used for their anaerobic coverage, and they have very good coverage of anaerobes, including that most important of anaerobes, which, do you remember what that is? The most important below the diaphragm anaerobe, often resistant. Start with a B. Yes, so bacteroides fragilis, so B fragilis. So these are the first drugs we've talked about that would have activity against bacteroides fragilis, which Again, is important primarily because it often is resistant, and so it's one of the harder to treat anaerobes. Um, so, really, what you use these for? Um, 
particularly cefloxacin and ceftriaxone, you would often use them for intra-abdominal infections. And so intra-abdominal infections typically have a mixture of gram-negatives and anaerobes. And so something like cefloxacin would be one good drug that you could use by itself often to treat intra-abdominal infections. Some of these agents, not cefloxacin and ceftriaxone, but some of the other drugs also have activity against, or they have use rather, in upper respiratory tract infections. So things like sinusitis or um, exacerbations of bronchitis or COPD patients as well. So a little bit of use maybe in pneumonia, but more for other respiratory infections that are a little bit easier to treat compared to pneumonia. So things like sinusitis that are relatively easy, easy to treat infections. So then we have even more, unfortunately, in the third generation cephalosporins. Um, so a lot of agents in this uh, group, I would ask that you focus really on this last drug. And so you'll, as I said yesterday, you'll be seeing ceftriaxone used in lots and lots and lots of different infections. Um, and actually, I have indicated IV there, but ceftriaxone also is available as an IM formulation, which is one reason why it's used so often. So this is a drug that we can also use in a community setting because we can give it as an IM shot as well. So that really should say IV slash IM. Um, Really, a lot of the rest of these, you may see them in community settings, but ceftriaxone, especially in hospitalized settings, but also in ambulatory care settings, is a very commonly used drug that you'll hear about quite a bit as we go forward. So we're going from, so now we're in the third generation, right? So we're going to have more gram-negative activity. <coughs> However, this is one of those examples where you don't completely lose gram-positive activity as you gain gram-negative activity. And so, these do still have some coverage of strep and staph, depending on the drug. And so again, ceftriaxone especially is, although it's a third generation cephalosporin that has very good activity against gram negatives, it has amazing coverage basically of gram positives, particularly strep. And so you'll see again, ceftriaxone used in lots of places where we're using it because of its coverage, especially of strep. Uh, so things like otitis media, um, pneumonia, so lots of places where ceftriaxone is useful because of its gram-positive activity. That said, in general, um, third-generation cephalosporins have better gram-negative coverage compared to gram-positive. So again, you're adding coverage of your Enterobacteriaceae, so your E. coli, your Klebsiella, um, Neisseria gonorrhea, and so ceftriaxone is the drug of choice right now for gonorrhea infections. Um, Importantly, however, so do you have coverage of pseudomonas and those other space bugs? And so you do not, with the one exception of ceftazidine. And so ceftazidine is the first cephalosporin we've seen that has coverage of pseudomonas aeruginosa. So again, that very famous nosocomial pathogen. So ceftazidine does have some role in hospitalized patients used for its coverage of pseudomonas. Uh, from an anaerobic point of view, above the diaphragm, so these would lack coverage of those below the diaphragm anaerobes, and so really not terribly useful for their anaerobic coverage. Um, we use these in a variety of, of places, again, subtracts, so you'll see in many, many different types of infections used very frequently. And then from a beta-lactamase production, I think I've mentioned before the fact that organisms that produce beta-lactamases typically do so at a very low level. They may not even produce any beta-lactamase, but some drugs, and ceftazidine is a particularly bad one, will induce or basically irritate bacteria and tell them to basically start producing beta-lactamase enzymes. And so third generation cephalosporins, especially ceftazidine, are what's known as strong inducers of beta-lactamase production, which is a bad thing because we don't want to induce bacteria to produce more and more beta-lactamase production. So as we'll see in a second, that becomes an important distinction between ceftazidine and one of the other newer generation cephalosporins as far as the, the induction of beta-lactamase production. So the fourth generation cephalosporins, so this is an easier list at least to know, and so there's only one of these drugs, and there's only ever been one fourth generation cephalosporin. So cefepime, or maxepime, which is an IV only agent, is the only available fourth generation cephalosporin. <coughs> so what is this? Um, give you. So it does have, again, a little bit of gram-positive coverage. You wouldn't really use this for its gram-positive coverage. And so, you know, when it comes to Staph aureus, for instance, MSSA, we've seen lots of drugs that cover MSSA, right? So you wouldn't use something like this that has such a broad spectrum of activity to cover a simple little MSSA cellulitis, for instance. We'd want to use a narrower coverage drug. But you can, these do have some gram-positive coverage. 
Um, but really, cefepime is more used for its gram-negative coverage, and especially here now, again, we have a drug that has a very good coverage of Pseudomonas and all of those other space organisms. I'll go through the space um, organism listing, by the way. Um, also, not a drug that you would use for anaerobes, and so really not a, a, an appropriate use for this drug, although it does have that above the diaphragm anaerobic coverage. Um, so really, this drug is used for serious infections in hospitalized settings, especially in patients who are, say, in ICUs who are severely ill. Um, so remember again, ceftazidine is the only other cephalosporin we've talked about that has pseudomonal coverage, a strong inducer of beta-lactamase production. So it's going to basically encourage the production of beta-lactamases by bacteria that it's treating. Those beta-lactamases will then inactivate um, ceftazidine. So it's basically almost killing itself by encouraging the production of beta-lactamase enzymes. Cefepime, on the other hand, is a weak inducer of beta-lactamase production, and so that's a good thing and an argument in favor of cefepime as opposed to ceftazidine. And so often from a hospital point of view, it becomes a decision of what should we use as sort of our anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin? Should it be ceftazidine or cefepime? And so because cefepime is a weaker inducer of beta-lactamase production, and also happens to be, <coughs> compared to ceftazidine, less able to be hydrolyzed by beta-lactamase enzymes, cefepime becomes sort of a clear, better anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin to be used in a hospital setting. So we used to have a faculty member here who used to say, I wouldn't pay a dime for a ceftazidine. But that helps you remember that ceftazidine is the inferior choice when it comes to pseudomonal coverage compared to cefepime. That would be one way for you to remember that difference. Then finally, we have um, one relatively new agent, so caroline or teflero. So again, some would call this an advanced generation cephalosporin, some would call it a fifth generation cephalosporin. There's really no clear nomenclature when it comes to what generation it belongs to. So what, what organisms does this drug cover that no others we've talked about covers? MRSA, right. So this is the only beta-lactam of all the beta-lactams that have to be against MRSA, and it was basically developed to be an anti-MRSA beta-lactam. <clears throat> so here we see that it does have coverage of strep as well, also covers MSSA, but again, this was basically designed to have activity against that PBP2A, and so for that reason, it retains activity against MRSA. Also has coverage of uh, your Enterobacteriaceae, um, your things like Haemophilus influenza. One important hole of this drug is that it loses activity against Pseudomonas. And so you can almost think of it as it gains MRSA coverage, but it loses some gram-negative coverage as a trade-off, basically. Um, for, as far as anaerobes, again, only above the diaphragm. And so this agent approved in 2010, so one of our newer antibiotics, so far it's been approved for skin and soft tissue infections, almost every antibiotic that comes out nowadays gets that approval. It's a very easy approval to get. And it's a very lucrative approval because we use, or we see lots and lots of skin and soft tissue infections. Also, it's approved for the use against patients with community, or use in patients with community-acquired pneumonia as well. And so um, this is an agent that really it's, it, we'll talk about this next week, but one of the, <coughs> the problems with antibiotics and the fact that um, companies don't develop new antibiotics is that when we have new antibiotics, so we have this shiny new drug that came out in 2010, and what we do as pharmacists and physicians when we have new drugs like that is we actively decide not to use them because we want to keep them in our back pockets basically for the future. And so this drug really is not used very much. Um, one problem I think is that it was developed to treat MRSA, but I think that was sort of a, it almost backfired against the agent because we don't want to use something that has gram-negative, gram-positive, and MRSA coverage. So again, it's that juxtaposition between using very broad-spectrum agents, which this is, versus very narrow-spectrum agents. And so this drug really hasn't been used very often. Has anyone ever seen this drug? You'd probably have to be in a hospital-based setting. So very little use of this drug so far. So any questions on cephalosporins? All right, so here's a question for you. So which of the following cephalosporins would not provide adequate impaired coverage when treating an uncomplicated skin and soft tissue? 
So first, what are the two organisms that we really are concerned about when it comes to skin and soft tissue infections? I think I'm hearing one or two of them. So staph, including staph aureus, other staph as well. That's the other. Also start with S. Strep. So strep would be the other one. So we're worried about staph and strep. So we want a drug here that has good coverage of staph and strep. So septazidine, you think? Which generation is septacidine? So I think I heard three. Yeah, so that's the third generation cephalosporin. So more of a grand negative drug, certainly. Um, unlike subtraxone, would not really have very good strep coverage. Um, Subterylene? What do you think? So Subterylene would be okay, I think. It would have you know, marginal coverage of staph and strep um, would be an okay drug. It wouldn't be an ideal drug for skin and infection because, again, that's a very, usually a very simple infection to treat, and so you wouldn't want to use something as broad spectrum as septaroline, but you probably could get away with it. So septazidine would not provide adequate coverage. Septaroline would. What about cefazolin? So what generation would cefazolin be first, right? So pretty good gram-positive coverage, including staph and strep. So cefazolin would be a reasonable choice. Um, and in fact, one of the main reasons that we would use cefazolin would be like the other first-generation cephalosporins for skin infections. And then finally, cefoxetin, what do you think? Yeah, it wouldn't be probably the best choice, and you'll learn about what would be the best choice for skin infections later on, but would have okay coverage of that, that staph and strep. So really, the agent that would not provide adequate repair coverage when treating a skin infection onto this list would be septazidine would be the, the answer to this question. So going through some of the some more beta lactams, so we have the carbapenems, and so we have imipenem, which comes pre-formulated along with silostatin, and we have miropenem, erdipenem, and doripenem. And those are really in order of when they were released. So doripenem is the most recently released of the carbapenems. So um, from a coverage activity, you might remember that I called these the so-called gorilla cillins, and I had a picture of the gorillas, uh, the, the virtual band. And so when I was in school, I learned about these being called so-called gorilla cillins. And so these have extremely, extremely broad coverage. So they cover many gram positives, including streptococcal species, MSSA, also Enterococcus faecalis. Um, would they cover MRSA, do you think? How many say these would cover MRSA? So a couple of you. How many would say not? So more that say not. So again, remember, of all the beta lactams, including the ones we've talked about so far and the ones upcoming, so Caroline is the only one that covers MRSA. And so these also lack that ability to bind that penicillin binding protein 2A. Um, they do, however, though, cover MSSA, so they cover susceptible staphylococcus. They cover basically any gram negative you would want to cover, essentially. So they cover all of your enterobacteriaceae, um, all of your space organisms as well, so things like Pseudomonas, um, all of those MDR gram negative pathogens. I didn't quite get that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the one exception would be erdipenem. So erdipenem is the only carbapenem that lacks activity against enterococcus, which is less important. We don't really use these drugs for <coughs> the most part, but we do often want to use these drugs for pseudomonal infections. So erdipenem is the only one that lacks, uh, that has a hole of not covering um, sorry, pseudomonas. Um, anaerobes, so again, these cover broad spectrum activity, so they cover not only those above the diaphragm anaerobes, but also the below the diaphragm anaerobes. So really, these, these cover practically everything you'd want to cover, essentially. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but extremely broad coverage. And so again, there's places where that's a very good thing, where we want to use these drugs, especially in someone who's severely ill. Again, we're in that empiric phase of therapy where we don't, don't know what we're treating, so that's a place where we have to use these drugs. 
but they also have the potential to be overused and used for places where we don't need quite that large amount of coverage, basically. Um, so that's the carbon penalties. And then finally, the monobactam. So there's only one available monobactam, so that's Trinam, which is an IV-only agent that you would see only in hospitalized settings and really not a drug that we use too often. So what does s m cover? And so um, there's not very many instances where you would say that a drug completely lacks coverage of gram negatives or gram positives. This is one of those situations. And so s m essentially has zero coverage of gram positive agents, but does cover and has very good coverage of gram negatives including, again, those space bugs. So I think with gram negatives, thinking in your head of space bugs and enterobacteriaceae are sort of the two large groups of organisms that we are looking at whether, whether we have coverage of them or not. Um, and also very, or no anaerobic coverage at all either. So really, this drug is used as a gram negative drug and that's all it's used for. <coughs> We'll talk about allergy in a few minutes, but this is a drug that's useful because if patients have a penicillin allergy, this tends to be the agent that they will not have cross-reactivity to. And so really the niche use of this drug is in a penicillin allergic patient where we want to cover things like pseudomonas and other gram negatives. So really used primarily for that indication, again, in patients who have that allergy. Actually, I'm going to go back just a few slides, sorry, because I forgot to go through what exactly the space bugs are. So here you see on the right the space bugs, I keep referring to them. So just an, a way to memorize, again, these are gram-negative pathogens that are primarily nosocomial uh, pathogens that tend to be multi-drug resistant. And so Pseudomonas is certainly the most famous and the most important of them, but you see the other ones are Serratia marcescens, Acetobacter, Citrobacter, and Anorobacter Colloquium. So those are the so-called space bugs. All right, so another question. So which of the following is true concerning carbapenems? More than one answer may be correct. And I think you've seen some of these more than one answer may be correct on your first two exams, I think. I will have some of these questions on my exams as well. So what about A? Only Doripenem has activity against Enterococcus faecalis. So really the only one that doesn't is uh, Erdipenem, right? And so that would be a false statement. Um, next, Erdipenem lacks activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Mm -hmm. Seeing a lot of nodding of heads, right? So that's a true statement. So Erdipenem is the only one that has that hole against Pseudomonas. Um, they display activity against <coughs> Lactoris fragilis. So would that be an above the diaphragm anaerobe or below the diaphragm? Below, below right. Again, it's that most important of them. And so these would all cover Bacteroides fragilis. So that would be a true statement. And the last one, actually, I forgot to tell you what Silostatin is, so I think you probably don't know the answer to that one, but take a shot. So Silostatin is a beta-lactamase inhibitor that adds coverage of MRSA. Yeah. False. Does anyone know what Silostatin is? So Silostatin basically is a, is a, a compound that inhibits the metabolism of any penem, so it helps with maintaining good concentrations of imipenem in the body. I forgot to tell you that, I'm sorry. So that's what silostatin is. And so imipenem is the only of the carbapenems that has that extra component, which again inhibits the metabolism of that drug and it makes it have better concentrations in the body. So not the beta lactamase Is that clear? So any questions on beta lactam coverage and spectrum of activity? So from an adverse effect point of view for not only these drugs, but all the remaining drugs, really I want to highlight the either most common side effects or and or most serious side effects. And so, um, you know, one thing that you'll see is there's not a single antibiotic that I know of that doesn't cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. They all do to varying degrees. But I'll try to highlight some of the ones that are 
more important causes of the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. <coughs> and so, as you see here, one of the first adverse effects of beta lactam would be GI. Um, so really, all of the drugs can cause that to varying degrees or another. One of the most um, notorious causes of GI side effects would be augmentin, and it's because of the clavulinic acid part of augmentin, and so that's a very famous uh, cause of things like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, remember Clostridium difficile infection, so that's caused by basically wiping out your normal flora and then allowing the overgrowth of C. diff, and so C. diff causes extremely severe diarrhea, uh, an important cause of morbidity and mortality because the diarrhea is so severe. So, um, any guesses? Is there an antibiotic that doesn't cause C. diff? What do you think? So there's no antibiotic that can't cause C. diff. Some are, are more common than others. These, I would say, are sort of middle of the road as far as the likelihood that they would cause C. diff. So not the worst offenders, but certainly fairly common causes of C. diff infection as well. So next would be allergy. And so beta-lactams are the most important cause of antibiotic-associated allergic reaction. So a fairly common um, cause of allergy, although as you see, patients generally do over-report over being allergic to penicillin. And so many patients who say I'm penicillin allergic, they're either like a case yesterday where it's nausea, or they had a very distant reaction that they don't remember very well. So we'll talk about allergy, but it's much over-reported compared to what it really um, there's a variety of different types of allergy. We'll talk about those in a second too. So other serious effects, uh, these are much, so I would say the hepatic side effects are much rarer. Um, and really those are, are side effects of primarily oxicillin and nafcillin. And so especially with long-term use, patients receiving oxicillin and nafcillin can have hepatic dysfunction because of the drug. Um, neurologic side effects are important. And so those would be seizures and encephalopathy. So seizures can be caused by all the beta-lactams, but those are especially true of the carbapenems. And so one of the important points becomes of the carbapenems, <coughs> is there a difference between the ability to induce seizures? And there is, and so imipenem of the carbapenems is the worst offender when it comes to causing seizures. Doripenem is thought to pose the lowest risk of seizures. And so if I gave you a patient case on an exam of a patient who had documented seizure history, and I gave you a list of drugs to use, you should be looking for things like for imipenem, and that would be a red flag to avoid the use of imipenem in a patient with documented seizures or a history of seizures. And then finally, from a hematologic point of view, um, these agents can cause different types of penias, so leukopenia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, really with prolonged use, so over two weeks of use. And we don't typically use these drugs for periods longer than two weeks for most infections. So relatively rare would, would be seen in hematologic effects. And then with renal side effects, um, nafcillin especially, again, more with long-term use can cause this type 4 reaction that can give you an interstitial nephritis. Relatively rare, but sort of a famous reaction that nafcillin is associated with. So getting into allergy and hypersensitivity. So one of the important uh, points is, what is it about the penicillin molecule that causes hypersensitivity? And so there's really two different things. There's what's called the major determinant and the minor determinant. And so the major determinant, which is the penicillol, penicillol moiety is, ca is a cause of greater than 90% of your type one reactions, but then you have your minor determinants as well. And so because you have the major determinants and the minor determinants, that really impacts kind of the cross-reactivity amongst all the different beta lactams because you have these different parts of the structures that can be responsible for causing allergy. So first, before we talk about the cross-reactivity, it's important to note what types of allergies can beta lactams cause. And so there's really two major types. There's type one events and there's type three events. So type one events would be IgE, Mediated and type 3 would be immune complex mediated. And so, to show you an example of what these look like, um, so type 1 reactions. Um, so, these are would be urticaria or hives. And so, this is an illustration of what hives look like. Um, I don't expect you to, to be able to diagnose someone with hives based on looking at them. So, I would tell you in a patient case that a person has had hives after being exposed to a penicillin. So, histamine mediated, IgE mediated. 
Um, these are asymmetric and irregular. They often occur on the chest and on the face, and they have areas where they have central clearing of that redness. Um, these reactions also are associated with itching or puritis. Um, important, they can occur any time after you've had prior exposure. And so type 1 reactions are the more serious reactions that you would see in patients who are pen allergic. And so, again, on a patient case, if I gave you a case of someone who, would, who reports a penicillin allergy, and if you see anything like hives, itching, shortness of breath is a big one, those are all giant red flags to you to be very, very careful about using a penicillin in someone who has those types of reactions, because those all indicate the possibility for anaphylaxis type reactions. And so very, very serious life-threatening allergic reactions would be what you would see in these patients. In contrast, so a maculopapular rash, um, the, most, the most common um, allergic or uh, skin manifestation of drug allergy. So these are a type three reaction. You see the difference there. So symmetrical as opposed to asymmetrical. Uh, they lack that central clearing, basically have relatively fewer cases where you would see puritis associated with these reactions. They often start on the trunk and often you spare the face, whereas type 1 reactions are often seen involvement of the face as well. Um, also may clear spontaneously. So again, if I gave you a patient case and someone reported a penicillin allergy and they had had a maculopapular rash, a penicillin may not be the best thing to give that person because we don't want to give patients rashes for no reason. But this would be a non-life-threatening situation compared to the previous slide. So I can guarantee you, you'll probably see some cases that have some elements of allergy. So just be careful about not missing those telltale signs to avoid penicillins. So any questions about that? So then, as I said, patients generally tend to over-report being allergic to beta-lactams. And so what this shows is, if you really look at people who are truly allergic, what is the overall global incidence of allergy to beta lactams? And so to penicillins, the overall incidence of allergy is thought to be anywhere from 1% to 10% of all patients truly have a penicillin allergy. As you see, more of those would be these sort of cutaneous reactions that would be non-life threatening. And when it comes to patients who truly would have anaphylaxis type reactions, so those life threatening reactions, as you can see, it's a very, very small number of patients who would truly have those types of reactions. And with cephalosporins, as you see, even less common as far as the overall rates, the cutaneous rates, and the anaphylaxis type reactions. So really, although many patients do report penicillin allergies, and again, it's the most common form of antibiotic-associated allergy, the real <coughs> incidence of these reactions is much less than is reported by patients. So then an important point becomes, what is the cross-reactivity? So you have a patient like CJ yesterday in our patient case who tells you, I'm allergic to penicillin, so penicillin G. So can you give that patient a cephalosporin? So it's a very common question that we see clinically. And so basically, if someone says, I'm allergic to penicillin G, you should assume they're allergic to all of the other penicillins, basically. You want to probably try to avoid penicillins especially if it was a type 1 reaction. You definitely want to avoid penicillins in that situation. So then with cephalosporins, and so it's thought, based on the evidence that we have, that it really depends on the generation of your cephalosporin, and so it's thought to be the case that if you're preparing or if you're, you're considering using a first-generation cephalosporin in a patient like that, there's probably about a 0.5% chance that that patient will become allergic to that first-generation cephalosporin. With the other cephalosporins, we think there's really virtually no risk of cross-reactivity whatsoever. Um, so then if you do skin testing, which we often do, and you have a negative skin test, you can really safely use a cephalosporin in someone like that. Um, with carbapenems, it used to be thought that carbapenems had about a 50% cross-reactivity, but newer studies have shown that that was a vast overestimation, and so it's thought to be less than 1%, again, risk of cross-reactivity if someone is pen allergic to giving them a carbapenem. And then finally, we have this really idiosyncratic cross-reactivity between astrinam and ceftazidine. And so, as I said, astrinam is used primarily because it lacks cross-reactivity. The exception to that would be that if you have a patient who is specifically ceftazidine allergic, they may cross-react with astrinam. That said, it's very uncommon to have someone say, I'm allergic to ceftazidine. So it's really not a situation that you see very often clinically. 
So questions on that becomes a very important part of the decision-making process when you're treating someone who has a documented penicillin allergy. So that said, if I gave you a patient case like CJ yesterday, told you that he's pen allergic and that he experienced shortness of breath and hives, and I asked you, would you consider giving CJ any pen? What do you think? Anyone want to try? Yeah. You do? Okay. Anyone not want to try? So you have less than a 1% chance of causing a reaction, right? So that would argue for maybe rolling the dice and trying. On the other hand, shortness of breath, hives, those are, those are signs where anaphylaxis is, is in play. And so, unfortunately, you're really rolling the dice that you probably have very little chance of actually causing an allergic reaction. But if you do, you might kill the person. So that becomes really uh, you know, an important part of the decision. And so, um, so I would say on an exam, from an exam point of view, if you see, again, those terms like shortness of breath, hives, just the steer clear of all beta lactams just to be on the safe side. In practice, however, you do find situations where you, you still have to use beta lactams, and we'll talk about that in certain infections where you still do use beta lactams even in patients where the risk of anaphylaxis is a possibility. So, um, and finally, from a drug drug interactions point of view, this is a relatively easy class of drugs. So, there are drug drug interactions, they are really nothing to be significantly concerned about, and so you're not going to have any of those really serious drug-drug interactions that are going to be cause, causes of mortality and morbidity, et cetera. And so really very few in the way of serious drug-drug interactions when it comes to the penicillins or all beta lactam. So I know we're a little bit before time, but I think maybe I'll postpone the meat glycoside. Is that OK? Oops. Um, any, any questions about anything we've covered today? Quiz? Quiz? How should we prep for the quiz? <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, there, there will be a quiz on Thursday or Friday, depending on the day. It'll be based only on the lecture slides, not on the readings. The readings may help you, certainly, but they'll be taken from the slides. I haven't posted the case yet. It'll probably be posted tonight, I think, unfortunately. I'm still looking for that. I'll look for that later today. Is it up to what we've covered or including what's coming up? So the quiz will only be what we've covered so far. So are you ready for four hours of IT fun? <laughs> so before I start, um, I just so, you know, as I've as I said, I usually record my lectures and post them. Um, the last time I lectured, my the recorder just stopped, basically. And so in the course of asking someone else to send me an audio recording, I found out that you have the YouTube link where you already have access to the recording. So is there anyone who is not aware of that YouTube link? We have a class stenographer. So um, <laughs> given that, then I'm going to stop recording my lecture because it's half the time I screw it up anyway. And so um, I would just ask that you use the YouTube link. If anyone has any issues with that, let me know. Is that OK? Yeah. All right, so um, continuing on with antimicrobials 101. And don't worry, I'm not going to go through all the slides that I posted today. And so we'll, uh, we'll get through some of those today, and then we'll continue tomorrow. We may even go a little bit into Wednesday, potentially. And then on Wednesday, We'll finish antibiotics 101 and we'll kind of cap it off and we'll it for TV. So we'll talk about it when we talk about tuberculosis. Um, but today, really focus your attention on gems, tobra, and amicase. So these are also protein synthesis inhibitors, so they work with the 30S ribosome. Um, so they inhibit protein synthesis, and hence bacteria can't manufacture the proteins that they need to survive consumption. Um, and where amino glycosides also have the, the added um, mechanism where um, those misshapen proteins basically become incorporated into the cell membrane, and so they kind of cause leaky cell membranes and lysis of, of cells. And so that's why, if you, were, you might remember that from pharmacology, we talked about that drugs that inhibit protein synthesis tend to be static drugs. This is one of those exceptions, and so these tend to be 
societal drugs. And again, mm -hmm. the whole static versus societal thing is not as black and white as I often make it out to be. But in general, they like to be societal agents. Uh, as far as resistance, the most important would be inactivation by enzymes. And so this is not um, cleavage of the drug like beta lactamase enzymes, rather, it's um, adding on a functional group of tissue, the immune glycoside, making it not able to bind to the ribosome any longer. So, for instance, being an acetyl group onto the immune glycoside renders it ineffective. Um, remember, too, that in anaerocoxi, which are facultative anaerobes and also true anaerobes, there's an oxygen dependent transport mechanism that brings immune glycosides into the cell, hence, immune glycosides lack activity against anaerobes. They also lack activity against anaerocoxide unless you combine them with a drug that pokes holes in the cell membranes and lets the immune glycoside get into the cell. And so we use these drugs in combination often with treating gram positive infections like anaerocoxide infections. As I mentioned, bactericidal and also concentration dependent killing. We'll talk about on Wednesday. This is one of those classes of drugs that we take advantage of PKPD issues and we dose these drugs in a sort of sophisticated manner compared to what we used to do, and so we take advantage of that concentration and activity of these drugs. So we'll talk about that one point. So pharmacokinetics, so no oral absorption, so we have no oral agents for these drugs. Um, as far as distribution, um, fairly wide distribution, so they do get good concentrations in many different parts of the body, urine, um, uh, lung tissue, et cetera. So fairly good volume distribution is important. Um, however, poor distribution into the CNS. And so with all of these drugs, you'll see me highlight, again, the, the level of um, penetration into the CNS. Again, getting concentrations into the small nervous system is fairly difficult, uh, the most difficult, really, of any part of the body. So that then lends, um, or the, um, affects, sorry, whether we can use these drugs for meningitis. And so maybe like this, I have a relatively um, low utility when it comes to meningitis because of that lack of good penetration into the CNS. As far as metabolism and excretion, so these are primarily renally excreted. And when we see, um, when we talk about adverse effects, that comes into play when it, when it comes to adverse effects. So these are definitely agents that we have to be careful about, and we dose differently depending on a patient's renal function. And so patients with renal dysfunction, we have to really take account of that and adjust our dosing of these drugs. So as far as the spectrum of activity, really, these are primarily gram-negative agents. They do have some activity against gram-positives, as you see. However, only, again, when you use them in combination with a beta-lactam, essentially. And so, uh, for instance, enterococci, you would never use these drugs by themselves. You would use them with a penicillin, um, primarily a penicillin. Um, with staphylococcus infections as well, you would use these in combination. So really, you should never see an amine glycoside used by itself for a gram-positive can use them by themselves for gram-negative infections. As you see with gram-negatives, um, they do have a wide uh, spectrum of activity, so they cover all of your enterobacteria, so your E. coli, your Klebsiella. They would cover some of those sort of minor respiratory pathogens like H. influenzae and more cellular catarrhalis, both of which cause things like upper respiratory tract infections. These also are ones that cover your space organisms, and so they cover pseudomonas and the rest of those space organisms, again, those multi-drug resistant gram-negative infections or gram-negative organisms that typically cause infections in hospitalized patients. Um, as you see there, um, in terms of the gram-negative spectrum of activity, um, amikacin has the best activity, followed by tobramycin, followed by genomycin. In most clinical scenarios, really, they're fairly inter interchangeable, and especially tobramycin and genomycin, I would say, for the most part, are fairly interchangeable, and they'll typically both have the same amount of activity against things. I think one uh, distinction, however, is that you can have um, for instance, Pseudomonas ruginosa that is resistant to Tobra and Gent that will not be resistant to amicacin. So amicacin tends to act, have activity against Tobra and Gent resistant strains, and we typically reserve amicacin for those instances. No anaerobic coverage. Um, again, streptomycin has activity against microbacteria, so we'll talk about that when it comes to tuberculosis. Um, so typically, where do we use these? Often. Again, we're going to be using these in seriously ill patients and patients who are in the ICU, for instance, um, largely for their gram-negative activity. We don't care so much about these drugs as gram-positive agents. We have lots of better, safer drugs that we can use for gram-positive infections. So really, combination therapy, um, often in the empiric phase of therapy where you don't know what the person has, 
so you would include this as part of a combination of drugs to cover gram negatives like pseudomonas, etc. Um, really, these drugs in recent years have kind of fallen out of favor, um, largely because of toxicity, as we'll see. So you'll see them used, but not as often as they used to be back in maybe the 90s, where they were kind of little hot drugs to use. And so really, um, this slide shows the reason why these drugs are falling out of favor. And so um, two really important and severe toxicities. So the first would be nephrotoxicity. So these drugs have direct damage to uh, cells in the kidneys. So they cause acute tubular necrosis. Um, you see the incidence is fairly common, especially when patients aren't being given the appropriate doses, when we're not taking the or um, watching renal function and dosing appropriately. Um, so these are direct nephrotoxins. Um, genomycin has a greater risk than tobramycin, followed by amikacin, has the lowest risk of toxicity. But really, they're all fairly similar, and none of them are truly safe as far as their nephrotoxicity potential. Um, the one good thing about nephrotoxicity is it's usually reversible. And so as long as you are cognizant of the risk of nephrotoxicity, patients who are receiving immune glycosides should have fairly routine monitoring of their renal function, so looking at creatinine. UN levels, and as long as you're careful in monitoring levels, and this is also a class of drugs where we monitor drug levels as well, and so you want to be careful that you're monitoring your drug levels and avoiding toxicity. So as long as we're careful with patients, usually this is a reversible side effect, although certainly still a concerning side effect. Then you have ototoxicity, so again, um, directly damage cells in the ear, um, cause auditory issues, hearing loss, uh, tinnitus, dizziness. Um, often patients will first notice this because they'll, they'll be a hospitalized patient in their hospital bed, they'll get up and they'll feel a little bit woozy and they may even fall potentially. And so, unfortunately, the hearing loss is fairly subtle and hard to capture. And so, one thing that we do uh, more and more often with patients who are receiving immune glycosides is that we do pre treatment hearing testing and then routine hearing testing during the course of therapy. Because again, it can be very subtle and you may not just notice that your hearing is going because it's that subtle. Um, Importantly, compared to nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity is usually irreversible, unfortunately. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the major problems with this level of toxicity. It's less common than nephrotoxicity, but when it happens, it's usually irreversible, unfortunately. It can cause long-term uh, deaths. So drug interactions, really not too many. The, the major ones would be additive nephrotoxicity and additive ototoxicity. Um, loop diuretics are the major example of class of drugs that when used in combination would cause ototoxicity, so relatively few drugs where the combination would give you ototoxicity, but more importantly is the combination that will give you nephrotoxicity. And unfortunately, as you see, vancomycin is there, and often, again, as part of your paired therapy phase where you have a patient who's infected, they're extremely critically ill, you don't know what's affecting that person. Often you're gonna to wanna to use a combination regimen that might include an amino glycoside plus another gram-negative drug Plus, if you suspect something like MRSA in that person, you would use primarily vancomycin. And so the point being that many patients, especially when you're giving empiric therapy, will get that combination of vancomycin plus a glycoside. And the two of those are separately nephrotoxic, and then when you combine them, they have even greater nephrotoxicity. So that's certainly an important thing to be careful about. Uh, Antitericin B and antifungal, uh, which is extremely nephrotoxic, so really damaging to the kidneys. Cyclosporin and immunosuppressant and then ed NSAIDs as well, I think, are sometimes an underappreciated cause of nephrotoxicity. So you want to be careful using especially high dose NSAIDs in patients who are on immune glycosides. 